Alan Peters, I work for the Agora department, the Mozart department that organizes conferences and debates here in Mozart. Um, I would just briefly like, would like to thank everybody who participated and made this uh, evening happen on behalf of our CEO, Paul Dujardin and Mozart. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Exico. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Isabel. And thank you, all the panelists who are here this evening. Um, our evening will be hosted by Mr. Lieven van der Houten, so I will give the floor to him now. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Hello, hello. Bonsoir, goedenavond. The rest of the evening will be in English. None of us is a native speaker, but we'll manage. And I hope everybody understands us. You look very professional all together. We are the amateurs, I think, tonight. In, on this very special evening in the shadow of uh, Keith Haring and on the crossroads uh, between art and HIV AIDS, we're gonna have a chat with uh, these fine people later on uh, with uh, Dorothy, who works with the uh, African community here in Belgium. And, oh, yes, come on stage, why not? Have a seat, this is Dorothy Adobea. We'll meet her later on. And that's Christiana from uh, Vienna. <laughs> but she works for uh, the, the Tropis Institute, the Tropical in Institute for Tropical Medicine in English, ITM in Antwerp. And we also have Matteo. Matteo is uh, a dancer. He has his own solo performance called Pass. And he works with uh, Jan Fabre as well. But that's all for later. We also have uh, Bernard Mathieu in the room and in the house. He's Mr. Leather. Okay, and he will join us in a moment. But first, we have someone from uh, Execo. That's uh, Mike Magny. You have the floor. And a uh, mic. I think it's working, yes. <laughs> so, uh, good night everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm not so good in English, so I print it for everybody. <laughs> also in French. <laughs> so, um, what works me today visiting the exhibition is a space dedicated to HIV. It shows how important the fight against the virus, the virus was for Keith Harry. I felt a lot of connection with the artist as I myself try to give a human face to the virus. I hope you could see the small video on the screen just before. Keith Haring was one of the first known artists who talk about his seropositivity without shame at the worst time of the epidemic when be, being HIV positive, positive meant that you would die in a very short time. Haring's integrity meant that his heart, his expression in public life, reflected his personal life and was therefore political. His peace, ignorance equals fears, silence equals death, was used at the very start of ACT UP, the Ed Coalition to Unleash Power, in 1987, one year before he became positive, positive himself. I've been HIV positive for the last two years and a half, and I've been an activist in the fight against AIDS over 16 years. I'm the chairman of Execo, a community organization promoting health for all men having sex with men, bisexual, homosexuals, no matter if they consider themselves gay or not. It feels good to know that so many people, so many school kids visiting here have to take notice, have to think and talk about HIV. I'm particularly proud, proud of the people who participated to the Living Library today. I really want to thank each one of you, and I want to thank all the support group for people living with HIV in Belgium, and thank Boda as well for welcoming our ideas and proposals. 19,000 people live with HIV in Belgium, but most of them live with a heavy secret. What will it take for a person living with HIV to say it just as easily as one living with diabetes? What can we do so that they can do Talk about it freely. Think about it. 
drug addicts, sex workers, gay men, junkies, hours and faggots. This is what AIDS has been about in its beginning. Do you remember the gay cancer? HIV somehow gave us the invisible, the unwanted, a platform, a right to exist in society. Sadly, through our suffering and the dying of many of us. We did not only become victims, we came out, we were angry and demanded to be respected and cared for. Today, the HIV epidemic has changed. People are less afraid than before. I've been undetectable a month after I've been diagnosed HIV positive. This means that I cannot transmit the virus anymore. It is now safer to have sex with a person living with HIV under treatment than with a person who does not get tested regularly. Thanks to PrEP, HIV-negative people can also enjoy sex more freely, with less fear. And this may be why it is becoming easier to talk about HIV today. HIV is now entering the museum with its memorial kills, as you will see tonight. Movies are revisiting the fight against HIV. And just this year, we had two Belgian productions, both brilliant, of Angels in America. It is as HIV was entering history books. The epidemics may change, but HIV is still very much present and is still a political disease today. 15% of the new diagnoses in Belgium concern men having sex with men. But only 5% of the prevention budget goes to our group. What reasonable reason, argument can you can explain that huge gap? The health of LGBTI people is more vulnerable in many ways than the one of the general population. Today still, our bodies have a high price, have to pay a high price because of homophobia. I feel honored to be part of that heritage and celebrate it here with you tonight. Drugs addicts, sex workers, gay men, queer people, we are here to stay, demanding the love, respect, and health scales we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And now, put on the flag, put on the sign, so that we recognize you. We're very proud to present to you Mr. Leather, Belgium, 2019. This is Bernard Forcing for later, so we'll it there. Um, good evening to all. Um, my name is Bernard and um, I am HIV positive. And um, I can tell you that I would never have thought that I would be able one day, even two years ago, to stand here and to tell this in front of an audience and even less in, in this national institution. So I will remember this 22nd of February 2020. And this will be one of the many dates of my personal relationship with this virus. Because I remember also 1985, uh, March 1985. I was living in Spa in the Ardennes. And I remember my professor of philosophy at school telling us that uh, we could well be a generation for which sex would mean death. And telling us about the gay cancer, that was 1985. I remember the 1990s, the early 1990s, where I delayed and delayed and delayed again my first homosexual relationship by fear of getting contaminated. So some people in the room might say that I overcompensated since then. <laughs> I remember the year 2000 um, and my coming out as gay to my parents, my family, my friends. Because there is something that we all have in common as a sexual minority, as, as gays. It's this feeling of being in the closet. 
this difficulty to tell who you are and to be who you are, this fear to hurt, to hurt the ones you love. Um, and at the end of the day, this sense of release when finally you are able to tell things. That's a bit what I feel tonight. I remember, I remember December 2011. And this was supposed to be a routine checkup in an HIV testing center. And I was there in the office of my doctor, crying. Complete surprise. I, I never know and I, I never knew how and, and when I was contaminated. And I was there crying. And I remember my doctor telling me that I should be cautious while crying because my tears could be contaminated. And this sense of a world falling apart, this doubt about my ability to ever rebuild a sentimental relationship. In, and that was in December 2011. In January 2012, a man I loved told me right in my eyes that he couldn't stand to live together with a the HIV positive person. Five months after, another guy, after the gay pride, even charming as the first one, told me it made no difference. And, um, and these words were the ones on which I could really rebuild my self-confidence. And then started in my life a, a period of a few months of, um, of slowly degradating health. A period where I felt intensively weak. A period where I saw um, brown spots on my body. You know, these Kaposi sarcom um, tumors um, that we see in the movies of the 80s. So it still happened in these years. Because at this time doctors were waiting before putting someone under treatment. We're waiting to the very last limit, actually. And, and at a point, my doctor had to admit that, yeah, that, the, that I had no other choice. And we started the treatment. It took two years for me. Two years and three treatments um, to finally be able to claim that I was undetectable. Which is a very strange expression, actually. Um, and which means, actually, that in my blood, in my body today, I still have a few thousand of HIV virus copies, but sleeping one. You know, these viruses which every day get attacked by an additional intake of chemicals and which are there but lazy, sleeping, giving up on, on their fight on my Immune system, uh, immune system. And what I know for sure is that this virus changed my life. It changed my life um, because it, it made me more tired, that's one thing. But it also changed my life because it gave me a sense of urgency. It gave me this need to, to live several lives at the same time. Um, I, worked, I worked abroad, I left Belgium, I, I went and, and worked abroad. I engaged myself in uh, development and cooperation for technological projects in Africa. I, uh, uh, I made very different things. And the very last one is actually this one. Um, I competed for this title. I think it's the right time. This sash has a particular meaning, actually. I had yesterday a, a telephone call with Daniel, one of the members of, uh, of MSC. So, 
Um, I had a phone call yesterday with Daniel, a member of MSC Belgium, who told me about this period in the 1980s, who told me about, about the fact that amongst his friends, 90% died in the 80s who told me that the leather community was one of the very, very first one to stand up for the rights um, of HIV-positive people. That the leather community created a fund, a financial fund, to help those who couldn't afford the first treatment to improve their day-to-day -day life and their day-to-day -day comfort. That they also organized visits in the hospitals um, for those who suffered, and for the many who died. And, and you know that this, this leather club actually was, was created, was funded in 1971. I was not born. Um, and, um, and we will celebrate next year the 50th, 50th anniversary of, of MSC Belgium. And it has a meaning, I think. It means something. There is an history behind that, and I think. And I'm, I'm proud somehow to, to continue to contribute to this, to this history by standing up here and sharing my experience. During my 12 months as Mr. Leather Belgium, because there, are, there will be an election next month and some of the candidates are here, um, during my 12 months as Mr. Leather Belgium, uh, I met uh, around 25 persons, 25 individuals. I had beers and coffees. I must admit, many more beers than coffees, um, with them. And they talked to me about the difficulties today for an HIV positive person to live in Belgium. So beyond the administrative issues, and there are still administrative issues, day-to-day -day difficulties. The difficulty to get a loan, you know, to purchase a house. Um, the difficulty to travel. There are 49 countries in the world with travel restrictions on HIV-positive people, including Australia, New Zealand, Israel. So it's not just, you know, the countries you would think of. Um, beyond all that, the one single common thing is the extreme difficulty to tell it. It's the extreme difficulty to tell the ones you love, um, the ones you cherish, to tell, your com to tell your company, your employer, that you are HIV positive. Most, most people actually don't tell it from those I met. Most people invent nice explanations for their many medical appointments to their employer. From my side, I must say that I remember I had many back issues in around 2012, 2013, which justified my absences. Um, most of them don't tell their family. Uh, they are very close, actually, family. And, and that's, of course, a, you know, an internalized shame that they feel and which makes their life more difficult every day. So it's important to tell it. It's important at a point to express openly things. And um, if I had to something to say to my HIV-positive friends, it would be precisely that um, that we should stand up. That Keith Haring showed us the way to stand up, to act up, um, and to, to tell to the world that we should never be ashamed because we are fighters. We are fighters and indeed to my, to my HIV positive friends, I would add that um, we should continue fighting to make sure that this virus is undetectable, but we, as individuals in our society, should aim at being very detectable persons. Thank you. Thank you so much for this event. And I think he has the right to be very proud of himself. So, now for our little chat. Maybe I can start with uh, a, a quick introduction round. Matteo, tell me something about... Oh, do you have a microphone? Some, some...
Tell us something about yourself. You're a dancer. Yeah, I'm a, born as a dancer and now I'm working as a performer and creator. I'm from Italy and I create together with Alessandra Ferreri and Joshua Van Adelbeck a collective called Vitamina. And together we, we are making our performance. And our first performance is Pots. That's your first solo performance exactly. after you've worked internationally. <laughs> You're an acclaimed artist. Yeah, I decided to, to start also a career as a choreographer and maker. Yeah, and you've worked with Jan Faber. Yes, exactly. Mount Olympus. Yeah, 24 hours performance. 24 hour performance, so you're a seasoned dancer. <laughs> Next to you we have Christiana. We all have one microphone, you don't, you don't have to share microphones. So, okay. okay. Hello everybody, good evening. My name is uh, Christiana Nöstlinger. Nöstlinger? Yes, That's... I'm Austrian, I'm from Vienna. Uh -huh. Thank you for having me. This Thank you for evening. being here. Um, I'm a psychologist and social scientist and I work at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. And as such I'm also the coordinator of uh, an HIV prevention project for Sub-Saharan African migrants. Because we have heard all, you know, Various groups were mentioned already in, in the testimonies we heard and in the speech. But there is also another group that is heavily and disproportionately affected by HIV and these are migrants coming from high endemic regions. And so we coordinate um, prevention and sexual health promotion, promotion for this group. Thank you. And then Dorothy, Dorothy Adobia. Yes, that's correct, very well. Um, so my name is Dorothy Arobea and it's actually very nice to be sitting here as well, especially next to my ex-coordinator because I used to work for the project uh, Christiana just mentioned um, and I was there also responsible for the outreach, um, community sens sensitizing and uh, giving out information about HIV and prevention for the sub-Saharan African community. Um, that was in a previous life, even though I'm still young. And now I work in the federal uh, parliament as a parliamentarian assistant uh, for a senator. And he's also involved in the Council of Europe. And we, mo we mostly focus about, age, uh, well, about social inclusion. That means um, if it's about uh, racism or poverty or LGBTQI plus um, issues. So those are the things that I've been doing right now. So, um, and the fourth one in our little chat is, of course, Keith Haring himself. And we're not, we're, I'm just about a little. This is this Matteo. I was a little bit confused. You looked a bit like like Keith Haring. But uh, Keith Haring, of course, um, heard his diagnosis in. A year before he died in 1988, a whole different era than we heard. Just just heard the testimony of, of Bernard. Uh, I was uh, shocked hearing what he only a few years uh, went through. But um, more than 30 years ago was still a different story. In the in, in the 80s. AIDS was, was a death sentence and highly stigmatized. So, do we know anything about how Keith Haring coped with the news that he had AIDS? Well, um, so when he, he got his diagnosis, um, he only had like two years after and then he passed away. So, he had a very brief moment actually um, to cope with that sentence and uh, what we've seen, Keith Haring was all, always an activist when it comes down to social teams. So uh, he was very vocal about the military complex in the US, he was very vocal and in the gay liberation front he was very open about his sexuality and uh, what we've seen just before was that he was always active with his art to portray the way that he saw the world. So when it come, came down to HIV, he, he portrayed the the fear that was among people uh, about this unknown disease and um, about how people reacted to 
to the whole gay liberation aspect and how the stigma worked on those communities. So um, I think in his art, um, which maybe some of you have seen in the expo, you could really see that he was trying to just yeah, portray the way that he saw the world and that was before his sentence, but then of course even um, after knowing that he was HIV positive, he just increased it. Yes, but we can't, we cannot imagine today the courage it must have taken him to come out as diagnosed with HIV. He, he stood on the cover of Rolling Stone and the invitations for, for parties and, and, and vernissages, they just stopped. So, it, yeah. there weren't so many people that came out as having AIDS. Yeah, of course, it's, it's still a, a current problem, of course, and that's the issue of stigma. Um, the whole issue of trying to hide the person that you are, and um, even then, in the testimony that we heard, um, that you just said, that your doctor said you can't cry because you might transmit that infection. Um, and especially... That was 2011. Yeah, that was even... That's, I'm so sorry to hear that, but that's, it's still alive. Even nowadays in, in hospitals you have healthcare providers who wear double, double gloves because they, they still assume that by some kind of other bodily fluid like tears or saliva that you might get HIV, which even if people are on their medication right now, they're undetectable. So um, there's a lot of ignorance, misinformation, and it just um, raises the stigma about the whole HIV epidemic and being HIV positive right now as well. So that's yeah. of course something that Keith and the whole community back then experienced as well. Yeah. Do you feel, Matteo, do you feel even today when AIDS is no longer uh, around, it's HIV, and HIV is no longer a death sentence, it's, it's people with HIV have normal uh, life expectancies, do you feel, uh, do you have the same story about, about uh, stigmata and ignorance? I didn't have uh, any experience about stigma, but I think it's, uh, sometimes it's really inside of our brain because when I discover that I am actually positive, I have a long year of uh, sadness and, and fear. I, was, I always say I was living in a kind of bubble melancholy. I was really scared so much that I want to quit my job. But then I started to make a research, to talk, and really open myself. And I understood that, uh, yeah, there is, there is stigma. Of course, but if you start to talk, to make a discussion, to let people understand, the stigma did just go down. But of course, it's a dead, maybe it's not a dense, a dead sentence here in some part of the world, but still in Africa, a lot of people die. Or in Russia, for example, one million plus people are living with HIV in the Russia of Putin. So the stigma is much more stronger. So I think we have to focalize as much as we can and uh, destroy the stigma because the stigma kill people. A lot of young a lot, a lot of young people kill themselves kill themselves for the fear, for the uh, for the um, yeah, because they are scared. Because they're scared they're not tested exactly. and so they they're not treated. Yeah, yeah. So the stigma kill, not the disease. Yeah. Or uh, rather the stigma than the disease. Um, I may pick on that. I'm very happy that you are saying that on a global scale, huh, it's only 60% of people living with HIV who can actually access medication. So we have to see only that. Only 60% has yeah. access. Yeah. So 40% has So, okay, in Belgium we are very happy. Huh? Like, everybody who will be tested will be linked to care, um, will receive treatment, and so we are in a luxur luxurious yeah. situation here. But I'm not totally everywhere in the world like that. Uh -huh. Back to the, the 80s and back to New York because we've touched uh, ACT UP. Do you know what it is? What is ACT UP? Well, uh, so ACT UP was a social movement, a social protest. So um, that was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power uh, movement where people were just 
really acting up because of the the lack of response of the but government. It was in a creative way as well. It was certainly in creative ways. It was with manifestations and protests, but it was certainly also with the with art. Uh, even the, the manifestations themselves, if you if you see images of it, um, it's very creative. It's very um, art. The, the statements were very bold. You had people going on the streets with um, um, made graves where they carved their names and say there's like three Americans, three Americans die every minute because there's no action on uh, on this whole AIDS epidemic. And we also have, of course, uh, Angels in America, which which was a huge success, which was which is now still still is a success, but you can still see it in Antwerp today in a, in a, a, a Flemish version, of course, but uh, AIDS and HIV has uh, has been a creative force as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, there were many artists that, that picked up um, the subject to, to fight against, even um, when it comes down to ACT UP, which was even helping for the gay liberation um, era in the US, you also had the more underground scene. So when you, um, because the people that came out to protest were still people that somehow had a little bit more privilege, and you had the underground scene where uh, people of trans people were there, uh, people of color were there, people that weren't seen in the mainstream, on the, on the streets or on the mainstream media at all, because there was even like more of a subcategory. Uh, uh, to be a person to be, so the whole voguing scene, the, the ball, voguing scene, yeah, exactly. the one we see portrayed in in the success series. Is, is it an HBO? No, it's it's an HBO series. I think so. Now it's become Pose. more popular. Pose, RuPaul's Drag Race. That's then with, of course, the whole drag scene. Um, but now it's it, it's becoming mainstream. So people are, are liking it. They're enjoying it. But uh, back then, of course, it was a whole. It was an act of rebellion just to to put on makeup and, and to be able to just feel free to be yourself as a man trying to portray a woman or something. Um, so that was also a very big scene that was, uh, that was active and they tried to, to cope with the whole exclusion and um, exclusion to the LGBT community and exclusion from the society by, by dance, by fashion. And um, so yeah, that was also very much alive back then and that's something that people should also try to remember. Yeah. And then the first steps of this acting up against all stigmata also came from this scene, this underground voguing scene. By the way, Madonna's Vogue exactly. is yeah. that was the first major born in, item. In, yeah, in, uh, in these uh, areas. And we tend to forget also what kind of massacre took place in these days, there were people, a whole generation. Yeah. I cannot imagine what it must have been. You're in your 20s and all your friends die. Because, I mean, there was, at that time, there was no HIV test, there was also no medication. So, you know, really using condoms was the only thing that people could do. And Ronald Reagan was president. And was it the punishment of God? Yes. So yeah. even um, in a, in, a year, in 15 years' time, 20,000 people died, and by 1995, um, there were 50,000 deaths just HIV only. Um, and as you said, Reagan was um, was in office back then, and he only addressed the HIV crisis way at the back of his of his term. Um, and then Bush came, and he even waited one more year extra to to, vo to be vocal about this epidemic that was destroying New York and uh, Harlem and San Francisco. Um, it was even um, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and Bill Clinton. They were the first politicians who really were vocal about the issue, and we even went to there was a big event, I think, of ACT UP, um, and they were there, so they recognized. The whole tragedy, the tragedy that was happening right there, and so if you don't see it, you can't, 
can't fix it, of course, if the papers don't write about it, or if the information is wrong that they write about it, uh, downplaying the whole epidemic, then you can't fix the problem, of course. People wouldn't get the right information. People wouldn't even know how the ways of transmission are. So uh, using condoms, of course, would, would have been the great way, but people didn't even know yeah. how to. But the massacre was so huge that people found the force to stand up and to find pride, and maybe today we still have the fruits from it. Our, our current situation is maybe if, if there is some positive thing that came out of this massacre is that the, the current gay pride maybe was born there. Could that be, Matteo? Yeah, yeah. Um, also because, for example, I am 29 years old and I, luckily, I have never known um, the horror of those times. But actually I, I feel it is inside of me, of me as a visual part of uh, the DNA. And also with the arrival of the new medication, we are talking about more and more about the normalization of the HIV. So we are losing the, the connection. We, we forget about it. The we connection of the past. We forget about the, exactly. the past. And but for me it's really important as an artist and a human being to connect, to, to keep this connection yes. with the past. Because I feel I own them. Thanks to them, thanks to their fight, their battle. But just with their life, I can live as a normal person. Yeah. This for me is amazing. Yeah. And we've seen some stills now. We see uh, the body mapping, we're going to talk about that later, but um, you were referring now, of course, to your own work. We've seen some stills from your, your solo performance uh, pause. Uh, I've seen pills. You're surrounded with pills. Uh, empty bottles. Empty bottles? Yeah, empty. <laughs> um, there are empty bottles of uh, antiretrial uh, medicine that uh, seropositive people use, and I collect and I still collect them uh, thanks to us, different uh, collaboration with uh, different association institutes. There you are, no surrounded ones. by pills. Why did you want to be surrounded by pills? Uh, because for me, uh, the empty bottles are the manifesto of the life. Our hope is inside of these bottles. We need them to survive. Um, and even the audience gets pills or candy yeah so. i changed the pills uh, like uh, the candy because i took inspiration from a work of felix gonzalez torres another visual artist style of aids um, when you were using the candy inside of the museum and i changed the pills as a candy and i want to thank uh, all the institution like tropical uh, medicine of antwerp or the sensoa the platform um, Sorry, <laughs> the platform Prevention Sida, the um, Centre Hospitalier the Universitaire de Saint Pierre, de Saint Luc, that helped me to collect these uh, these bottles, these empty bottles, empty bottles, yes. Um, Can I say something on that? Of I would also like to mention that these these social pressure groups like ACT UP and others that they had also a very important role when the medication was available because in the beginning days it was very very expensive and they really you know made a lot of fuss about it and so they really helped also to reduce the threshold and, and the barriers to those medications so i remember like the first aids conference the scientific conferences where we went act up would tear down all you know the 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 stands of the pharmaceutical companies of course the, the, the first medicine was called ACT. ACT, yeah. yeah. I was very expensive. And it's, I mean, it's still expensive, huh? Yeah, when I check my receipt, I see that my bottles cost six, 600 euro. Yeah, yeah. Super expensive. You don't have to pay anything. No, exactly. Lucky. It's, it's lucky. Like the insurance pays exactly. Exactly. Luckily. So we can say it's really a movement that accompanied also all this tremendous yeah. evolution that we have seen with yeah. the HIV. Yeah? And this journey, uh, from uh, the darkness to, to the light, from the acting up, that's your personal journey as well. You could have chosen to be silent about your situation. Uh, 
yeah, exactly, I could, but um, like I said before, I really uh, feel I own these people that died before me and I needed to express myself because I fought a battle that contains all our ancestral fear, the impossible contagion, the impossible love, the unknown source, the loneliness, and through my pain, I want to show how, how much I love my life. It's, it's really um, to say to the world that okay, I'm actually positive, but I'm here. By confronting it, yeah, exactly. And moving on, moving on, talking about it, I'm here. You're, you're getting stronger. Exactly. I use the the creation of the pause of the show as a therapy therapy uh -huh. to get more stronger and help me a lot. And would that be something you would advise to everybody who gets the diagnosis so don't be quiet, confront it? I talk something. about myself because maybe for some people it's not it's not good to talk because maybe they have a different situation. But of course I think the only way is is talk to make a discussion. But it depends on the situation. So you use it as a therapy and it did help? A lot. Art helps. Yes. <laughs> it saved my life. Studying all the, the artists that are and were uh, seropositive, it, it changed totally my life. Because I understood that they use the heart as a propaganda and they use heart to destroy the, the time, to destroy this opposition between life and death, war and love. And they use the heart to go on. Maybe if, if you would have kept silent, maybe you couldn't be a dancer anymore. Exactly. Maybe the dance, the dance, the heart is the key that gives me the possibility to, to talk. So sometimes I, I'm asking to myself, what Kittering was thinking while he was doing heart, seeing his, in front of his eyes the, the countdown of his life and the life of his friends. And this question um, inspired me as an artist and a human being. Did you have any, any negative reactions at all? Yes, one time, really strange, in America, I was in New York, I was talking to these two guys uh, about sex, uh, and at the same point they told me, ah, we are, uh, we took, uh, we are taking PrEP. And I said, ah, okay, cool, uh, I am actually positive. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, for me it was like, what? So you are taking PrEP? You are scared of the HIV? Just one time up. But for the rest, it was really... The other people, my friend, my family, were okay. The other people were taking yeah. PrEP as a, as a precaution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think because you said before that it's in the head of people, huh? but uh, since so recently they did actually research on that, so they asked many HIV-positive people about their needs on many different domains, and one of that was also the reactions they received when they talk about uh, being HIV-positive, and I think it was about 40% of the people who said that they actually had had negative reactions. So it's both in the head, but it's also real for many people. It's for real, so it happens. There, and there is a reason for being cautious and, and thinking yeah. and is there a difference? about who you tell and who you don't tell. Is there a difference between, let's say, an, an, an African woman in Belgium and a European man? Is, there, is, is, is it easier for people like uh, Matteo to come out as being positive? I think that it's actually easier because as you said, you are telling people and you are not losing your social network. And what we see very often with uh, migrants with an African background, the community <coughs> stigma, as we call it, is really very high. Many people have really this picture of AIDS in Africa still in their head, so like a fatal disease, um, the taboo of promiscuous sexuality that they link it. Many people also may believe that it's a punishment of God or even like there is witchcraft involved or these kind of things. So this fuels the stigma even more. and. Although we have not done research to really compare, but I think 
the fear to tell and the fear of what will happen if I tell is for a sub-Saharan African woman still very, very strong. Very strong. And so when that woman comes to the Tropical Institute, then she, she, already, she already has a, a long journey behind her. It took a lot of courage to come to Antwerp then. Um, yes. Maybe, and, so, and maybe and, but a often, lot of them often the, the healthcare providers are often the only people who actually know about them being HIV positive. So they keep silent. They keep very much silent, yes. And you made these maps with them, body, body maps. Yeah, in the exhibition uh, we also saw this slogan, uh, silence is death. Silence is death. So this was very similar for many of our African patients and so we also tried to use art to visualize certain things that they cannot talk about. And that is something that uh, people have worked extensively with in South Africa, not only for HIV but also for other diseases. And so what you try is really to express yourself through drawings, through paintings. And it's a, it's a facilitated process, so you don't put just people there and, and let them do something. But it's a guided process and in a, in a group and then you gather and people discuss what they have drawn. And oh, like that? in the end, it's really like, like laying down on the big canvas and drawing your whole body and then uh, visualizing the virus, your so social they, they, support. So they draw their, their own body and then do something with it. Yeah, their colors. future aspirations, what they would like to achieve, um, and also their social support, so that's also something which is then very important in this trajectory, that you make people think that actually you have a lot of resources, but you need to use them also. And they, there was there has been an exposition of these body maps uh, yeah, there in were, Temzig, uh, yes, I thought. at the Verbeke Foundation Verbeke once. Foundation. Yeah. And we also had an exhibition at, at uh, World AIDS Day, at, uh, I think 2014 or something like that. It's also very important that people then use the produced body maps to talk about it. And some are able to do that, others not yet. It's a, it's a personal decision if, if you dare to give really a testimony with, with that painting. And how do they visualize the virus, if they do? Uh, that's very different, you can see it on some of, of the body maps. Huh? Uh, Sometimes they, they have... Very often it's like a black, some, a black thing, a black round thing that invades the body. Um, but others have also visualized it in a way that they said, I have actually become a friend with my virus. Huh? So, a woman I really How can you become a friend with your virus? It's like a coping strategy. So oh, you, you, know, you recognize that feeling? Because if you don't, if, if the relationship with the virus is not anymore that it's your enemy, you have to live with it. You can give it a place, you can integrate it in your life. So. And uh, who came with that idea of? Letting your patients, so to speak, draw their own body map. Was that your idea? Um, actually, I don't. I think we saw an exhibition somewhere, and we, because we felt that for many African patients it's very difficult to talk. You know, talking about mental health and talking about health in general is also perhaps a very Western concept. So, people who are not used to express themselves with words, um, using symbols like Keith Haring also did, he eh? gave us very strong symbols of HIV and of many other things. So, that can actually help. If you then talk about what this means, um, it can, some people can more easily express themselves. And afterwards they felt relief. Yes, yeah, I think so. I and some guess. made even the decision to disclose for the first time in public. So, and it also helped them to increase their self-esteem because 
when they start it, very often they say like, I won't be able to do this because I'm not a painter. But then in the end you paint this big canvas and people really feel like they have accomplished something. Yeah. And do you encourage people to disclose, to tell, to, to tell to their family, to tell to their friends that they are HIV positive? Yeah, we do that, but it has always to remain a personal decision, so they have to you know, balance they have to very be well ready the, for it, but the it's pros always better to tell in the end. And they, we also support them in, in kind of thinking, okay, how if, if I'm ready to do it, how should I do it? So that you can anticipate the kind of reactions you will receive, that you can prepare yourself. Some people would argue it's just a private matter, it's my health, it's private. Yeah, why, should I, why should I talk about it? Yeah, but for people themselves, it's very often like living with a secret. So, that may also be a motivation, because living with a secret can also be quite a burden. And you can access more social support if people know, because people will support you and, and will help you. Because I think that a lot of people are very silent about it in, in Belgium. Yeah, I think from the, from the same Sensor research, uh, people from Sensor are here, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one in seven did not tell anybody else. One in seven did not tell anybody else. Is that correct, Patrick? Okay. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> But it's, uh, uh, people forget about it, forget about HIV and, and AIDS because they don't know anybody who has it. I think if, if one day everybody who is positive would have a kind of sign on his head, you would be surprised uh, on the morning train. Yeah, but it's very difficult us to, like we have these offers of support groups peer support, so where people could meet other people who are HIV positive, but it's a big barrier for many people to accept such an offer. So, it's not so easy to, to get them in such groups, to exchange. Yeah. Because there is, it's one thing to disclose your, your positiveness to your friends and your, your, your husband or your wife or whatever, but to the larger community that's a whole different thing of course to your employer. Well, that's a question, of course, what you have, if you have to disclose to your employer. You have also the right not to disclose. Exactly. So, yeah. But there's an, a, a, another side, of course, that's when nobody tells, when nobody is like Matteo or, or, uh, or Mr. Leather, then nobody knows and there is no interest and there's no... It's just not there. Then. It doesn't exist anymore, isn't that? I think that's too cold? Th that's the, the the shadow side or the, the drawback of the medical evolution that we have seen. And as good as it is that we have medication and, and treatment, but it medicalized the whole problem. And the social movement around HIV has really diminished. Quite a bit. Because the problem has to be. Because everybody can just consider it as a, as a private problem. Eh? Yeah. Excuse me, what was it? Not for the banks. But the AIDS is the big, big, biggest business in the world. I, I like the AIDS is the biggest business of the world. Uh -huh. So. Uh... What's your, what's your opinion about it? About what, sorry? About telling people as, when, when you're HIV positive, should you keep silent? Should you scream it out? Should you... Well, I think I, I fully support Christiana and I think Matteo as well. It's, it's an individual choice that should be made um, for some people telling might give them a sense of relief for some people might complicate things a little bit more and uh, there shouldn't be any pressure to 
to disclose anybody or to let somebody disclose his own status if, if that person is not interested. So yeah. uh, all the power to, to the person in general. Yes, of course. Uh, you and what, what you said before, huh? you said also the, co the contact is very important. So I think that's also scientifically proven huh? that stigma goes away if people know somebody who is HIV positive. But that's the other right. thing is, we should not put all the burden for the stigma reduction on the HIV positive people. On the because free, they, on the free because there is also people. a responsibility of the community as such to not stigmatize. Yes, of course. So it goes hand in hand. There should be more people, I think. Ro more role models. It's a real problem of the society. I mean, AIDS is, is not a human disease, virus, is a disease of the society. Yeah. So, we're waiting for the first real star or, Bel or Belgian news uh, anchor or journalist or whatever or politician to come out as, uh, as HIV positive. That would be a great thing, of course. We're also waiting for the the, the football players to come out if they are gay. Yes. <laughs> you know, so. yes. Of course. So, but you work uh, mainly with migrants, uh, African migrants. For the for the social support uh, and for these things that we've done, uh, I work mainly with uh, Sub-Saharan African migrants. But we have we do research at uh, the institute with a lot of different groups. We also do a lot of research around PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and that's also an interesting thing. So that's a prevention method, uh, a biomedical prevention method that everybody can use, but we only see men coming, and men who are having sex with men who are coming forward to take this prevention method. So that's also very interesting yeah, to is, see. Is, is PrEP uh, common practice in, in, I don't know anybody, who, uh, who, not in my family as so to speak, but is, is there uh, a lot of use of PrEP in a, as a precaution? As an, as well, we're seeing an increasing number of men coming forward for PrEP, so I think now about 2,000 men in Belgium. Not who are taking it. Because in, in the United States it's, it's very common. But not over here, not in the same way as, uh, as it is in, in, in the States, for instance, that gay men lose the condom and use PrEP, so to speak. I, I think it's increasingly used, so... Yeah. Yeah. And is it easy to, uh, to get access to a medication for migrants, even I think of I mean, for HIV medication. HIV medication, yeah. yes. Well, in Belgium, there is free access to HIV medication for people who are having health insurance. So, in that case, it's easy. Um, for people who do not have papers, they can also access medication, but then there is a very complex uh, administrative procedure in place, so you have to find the people who do this for you and you need to have an address for instance. So here you can already see that, for instance, let's imagine a person who uh, has no papers, has no permanent housing, no permanent address, um, is already in trouble. Or if living with other people, for instance, would need to disclose in order to be able to use the address. So you can see that if, if the access is restricted, people begin to struggle with disclosure. So uh, it, it happens that you lose sight of people and they, you know, they need their yeah, medication yeah, yeah, and, for sure. and they Even just disappear. Particularly because uh, migration policies are, have become much more restrictive during the last year, so people who do not have papers are quite afraid to get in touch with the, with the system, with the healthcare system. They are afraid to be deported, although that, that would not 
be the case necessarily, but there is also this fear, so people then would choose not getting medication over, you know, being deported. Yeah. And how is the situation in, in other countries? Because here, over here, it's, it's just a, a chronicle disease, so to speak. You can, be, you can lead a very healthy life. Uh, it's, it's not a huge, uh, life-threatening uh, problem. But in other countries, how is, uh, how is the ac access to medication, for instance, the Congo? Yeah, as I said, globally, yeah, we know that the coverage is 60%. So then, of course, in, in African countries, you see also very different rates of access. But it's not, you cannot take it for granted that people in Africa will receive treatment. As so they die here. eventually. And people also there are, if, I mean, I'm not a doctor. There are also some doctors in the room. Eh? But also the type of treatment that is available is, is different. So when what is called the first line treatment is not working anymore, it will be much more difficult to get more fancy medication. Um, so so people there is still a difference between resource rich and resource poor countries. Yeah, and if they don't get medication, they get AIDS and eventually die. That still happens, we tend to forget that. I mean, like, for adolescents and young people in Sub-Saharan Africa, AIDS is still the second leading cause of death. So, young people in Africa still die. And uh, you have young mothers as well in your, in your institute. Uh, so, they are particularly vulnerable because if, if they or, or women want to become a mother, they have that, that's another complication, of course. You, you have to be extra, uh, you have to take extra precautions. Well, if they take medication, um, now the chance is to pass on the virus to an unborn baby or during delivery is really very, very small. So, what is really important to hear is that if you have uh, women in, in very vulnerable situations, that you get them to antenatal care and, and that they can get tr treatment on time. Of course, that's uh, very uh, important. So, um, maybe there are any questions in the audience? Because I think we have a very professional audience tonight, people who know already very much about the subject. No questions at all? That surprises me. Yes, of course. Uh, I don't have a question, but just a comment. Uh, I want to thank you, Christian, for, for yeah. mentioning waste management. Uh, yes, I want to thank you, Christian, for bringing up the issue of the attitude, and I think, Montero, you touched on this too, um, the attitude that one has Stigma. Um, I feel like, as any um, 
thing that is embedded in our society, it's, it became something uh, systemic somehow, and, and because there are positive people, there are negative people, and um, I think that when we're on the side of the privilege, as negative people, um, we have a responsibility as an ally, but we have this amazing so-called privilege, like I'm in it, I can talk about the disease as much as I want without risking any stigma. Um, so that, that's, we, we, of course we should listen and be ally and stand on the side or in the back of people and, and letting positive people in the front of that, of that struggle, but I think that as, um, there's, it's so easy as negative people to talk about it and, it's, and, and educate ourselves and not wait like moment for this one. I can say that I grew up in a very activist environment as a gay person and it took me so long to realize how ignorant I was because I met the generation that, you know, I was not, I was too young in the 80s to, to, to have a sexual life, so I didn't face that. And I, just, I thought I knew, I really thought I knew about AIDS and HIV. And I had to encounter it in my life to, to educate myself. And it's, it's so sad that it took me this to learn and to read and to listen to people. So I would just, I would just really tell to my, my, my negative friend uh, that it's so easy to talk about it. So please, negative people, talk about it, talk about it. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to say uh, a similar thing. Um, I would like to highlight the responsibility that negative, HIV negative people have uh, for two reasons. One is because, as a previous uh, friend said, some uh, HIV positive people do not uh, dare react when they hear things like, are you clean? Because maybe they do not want to disclose their own status, but negative people can talk without fear uh, of being misunderstood and say, oh, why are you saying that? I mean, since I uh, realize that I'm surrounded like my best friends or uh, people that I really love or family are, are, are positive people. I started reacting myself when I hear these things. And I think we have, negative people have the responsibility to react. We also have another responsibility um, when uh, we have friends who come to us who just were um, detected uh, positive, that they are in a loss. They know that reasonably this should not really change their lives with the medication that we have today, with the information that we have, but still they're in shock when they come to us crying many times. We have the responsibility to be there and to reassure them with the original, our, uh, reasonable arguments, of course, but also to uh, reassure them that we are there no matter what. They can't come to us. If every patient positive people who was just detected knew that they have at least one person to whom they can, whom they can call any time of the day or night and talk without fear, without uh, shame, um, I think we can help a lot of people. Negative people have a lot of responsibility, I think, and we should ask ourselves, you know, but realize it. Yes, that's, I, I guess everyone agrees that, uh, and what, what? I think I'm very happy and that you brought, you two brought up this point because um, what we can do as negative people is, is of course give out the correct information um, and also, as you said, if somebody asks the question, are you clean or something, language is a very powerful tool to really stop the stigma. So as a negative community, everybody, regardless anyways, but especially when you're having that privilege, that, uh, that really, uh, yeah, giving the correct information, being open and uh, disclosing or shutting down any kind of negative talk surrounding the topics are things that we should and could do. Yeah. We should also like keep hearing on, you know, like using the symbols, using the, the promotion, the tools that he gave us and use them still today and not only at World AIDS Day, but keep hearing on. Keep hearing on. Keep you know? hearing on. He showed us how to because do it. Because there is having a lot of chemical sex or chem sex and, and the risk of uh, getting AIDS, getting HIV. Yeah, I mean, there are studies, that, there are more and more Sorry, studies. Yeah. Coming. That's not my question yet. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, that was not my question, but please move for it. There are more and more studies being done on, you know, chem sex and trying to understand um, 
the factors that drive people doing chemsex. And we see also, but I'm not an expert in that, so you know, don't don't quote me on, on you know any real scientific results. But I think in general, what we can say is that if people are doing a lot of drugs, they will lose control more. Huh? So it will be more difficult to use other prevention measures. So, for instance, if people are on prep, that's perhaps not so much a problem on for HIV risk. But we see increasing rates of other sexually transmitted diseases, for instance, which of course are treatable, but it's also a health consequence. Huh? Um, I, I think chemsex for many people, up to a certain degree, they can manage it. The question for many people is when they feel that they are out of control in using the chems, so then they really should get some professional help and I think as of today we do not have very good offers for those people. More questions? Deep silence. Uh, yes, please. Good evening. Um, it was mentioned a few times here, um, do not, uh, how uh, you've had bad experiences with healthcare professionals, and I was wondering um, if anyone wants to, to tell me, because I'm a young, I mean, I'm going to be a doctor soon, how, can, what are the things you wish your doctor knew, or how did you, how did you wish your doctor acted when he gave his diagnosis, or? I mean, I was wondering just what can the healthcare professionals do to be better at their job when this happens? Matteo, I'm looking at you. <laughs> How was your doctor? My, my doctor is, is a super cool pers person. I mean, it, mm, she doesn't judge. Uh, I think it's really the only way you don't, don't judge. Which just don't. I don't know. This is a difficult question. <laughs> but for me, as a patient, 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 I would love to truly really don't feel this judge. Okay? I can talk about to my doctor everything uh, openly I want, sex, uh, uh, other disease. Uh, uh, I think I have to feel comfort, comfortable at home, like I'm talking with my best friend. And she advised me everything, good and precise. Okay. Yes, of course, please come. Uh, 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 are you with, you were going to yeah, I wanted to answer, yes. yes. Um, what we need for the doctors is that they have to know, they, yeah, we have to talk freely to our doctors about everything, about sexuality, about drugs, about everything that can have an impact on our health, of course. We have not to be judged because if you are judged, you don't tell. And also, yeah, doctors have to know that the health of LGBTI people are not the same. So they have to, to focus on different things. And that's really important. They have to, when, when the patients are, are talking about their sexuality, they have to know, okay, maybe I should ask more often to make an HIV test because he's gay, he has more risk. So that's the things. I want my doctors to know. <laughs> yeah, and I add shortly that uh, you know I had a very good experience with Execo a few years ago when I went to you know on the Sunday afternoon they have a they have a piece of cake and coffee and 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 we discuss uh, between uh, with groups of uh, HIV positive people and I must say that we have a good discussion about comparing our doctors. You know we make benchmarks and uh, and at this time I changed my doctor and my new one is a much better thanks to Execo. <laughs> so we also try to you know to exchange information and that's the role of Execo or Sensor also to have these groups of discussion. I think also the problem doesn't lie so much I mean HIV care, I think it's people are generally very satisfied. It's more, you know, with other doctors who are not HIV specialists like dentists or gynecologists, uh, sometimes even primary uh, practitioners. So we have to train those 
doctors as well, so so that they are more knowledgeable about HIV. And especially dentists. I was wondering also, just to, to finish on this point, do you feel, all the people who have talked, that younger doctors are better at this? Are they being taught better than maybe doctors were 20 years ago? Or not so much? Yeah, it's difficult to compare. Actually, the, the nurse that she told that I was HIV positive, actually she was more scared of me. She was scared? Yes. She was like, mm, uh, you know, you, uh, you are me. HIV positive. Yes. <laughs> that was the, the first time someone yes. told you you yeah. are... No, I knew it because um, my, uh, my friend told me that he has HIV, so he passed me, so I knew it already. But the nurse that didn't know, she was... Uh, mm, mm, mm. And also dentists. Mm. Yes. <laughs> have, you, have you negative experiences uh, with Not dentists? Um, me, but my, some of my friends, yes. Okay. For example, they took an um, uh, appointment, and they told that... Uh, because they, they have to come, uh, fill a form in Italy, this one. I don't know your knowledge. But I hear something in Belgium similar. And um, so they have to uh, fill a form and they wrote that they, uh, that they are HIV positive. And then they put, then this put them the last uh, of, the queue, of the queue. Uh -huh. Just to protect the rest of yes. the, the patients. Yeah. That's awful. Yes. And what was new for me also is what Bernard told us that there are restrictions to go to Australia. But also in a in a Buddha. So if you if you look on the web on the so there is a platform on uh, the web about restrictions to travel for to travel for HIV positive people and there are indeed there is a long list with very different levels of restrictions obviously. And so these restrictions can apply for example to to migrants with HIV and they are, uh, uh, as a tourist but when indeed, you go to, uh, as a tourist when you go to Australia do you have to say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm HIV positive? Uh, so, you know, in many countries, I don't know about Australia, but you would remember that a few years ago, when you, had, when you went to the US, you had to fill in a, a form, and you have to tell if you were HIV positive or not, and, you know, everybody lied, or I assume most people lied. Everybody uh, lies. But, uh, but now it's not anymore the case, I believe, for the US. Is um, but it, it exists, yeah, there are limitations, and, and of course the level of limitations is very different from the one country to the other, but indeed, but in the list of the Deutsche AIDS Hilfe, which is uh, updated regularly, you will still find Australia and New Zealand and Israel as, uh, let's say, Western countries. Yeah, but everybody, you're allowed to lie. I think also in Dubai you cannot uh, live and work there as a HIV positive. In Dubai you cannot live and work as a HIV positive. Because it becomes different if you want to be a residence permit, so then some countries require an HIV test. Some countries require an HIV test when you want to become a resident. And you have a, a, to go to a doctor to, to assess your status. Wow. That's new for me. And what countries? I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> Look at check. She said Egypt. Egypt. China, Turkey. Russia. Singapore. Singapore. So there's a lot of work to do for prevention. And Australia. I don't know In the 90s, but we don't know. They abolished the rule. Well, we'll look that up when we get home. More questions? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, it's not a question, but a uh, remark to the coming phys physician. Have a, we was asking what she should do or what the physicians should do. I'm referring to a discussion I had with an HIV specialist last week. 
who are saying, well, anxiety and depression is more frequent uh, in the gay population than certainly in the HIV population for different reasons. And then I ask this, but what, what is done? And the problem is, in the HIV departments, there is no budget enough to have enough psychologists and so on to take on all the problems of depression or even asking the questions to, for example, the, the new HIV person. This my remark would be that certainly the general physicians uh, should have more a proactive role in asking questions, in trying to check if a HIV person has a difficult period, uh, has some anxiety and depression. Because we know all that during your life of HIV, you have periods of problems, and, and that is not uh, well done, actually, uh, even in a rich country like Belgium. Still a, a lot of work to do. I guess we can wrap up the question round. So I'm looking for Isabel. Where is it? Ah, there is Isabel. Isabel, you have a plan. Yeah. Can you tell us about our plan? Maybe, maybe I can give you a mic. Thank you. Isabel Santis. La, la fabrica. That's yes, it's a, it's a subject of the, the soirée. Uh, now we act together. Now it's time to stand up together. I know some, some and more of some who have a lot of uh, do now. I stop English. My English is so never okay. good. So in French, because my English is in French, we say Spanish co. So I'm stop. Alors, je sais que beaucoup, vous avez plein plein de choses à faire ce soir, comme on dit en France, un carnet de balles très très rempli, surtout ceux qui sont en cuir, mais restez encore un petit peu avec nous. Euh, je suis un activiste de la lutte contre le sida depuis plus de 30 ans, et je suis venue avec d'autres activistes français, belges et à travers le monde pour partager une cérémonie euh, du souvenir avec vous. Ce souvenir, c'est un acte politique, c'est aussi un acte artistique, c'est aussi un acte peut-être thérapeutique, en tout cas c'est un acte qu'on va partager ensemble, c'est aussi un acte qui a une histoire. Euh, il y a cinq ans, on a créé la Fabricart, c'est une association française, parce qu'on voulait célébrer le fait qu'on continuait de se battre, mais qu'on continue de se battre en créant. On est des patients expertes, on est des activistes, on est des soignants, on est des artistes, et on a décidé en fait de partager l'histoire de la lutte contre le sida, qui est pour nous une clé pour se battre pour d'autres situations, d'autres maladies, d'autres stigmas. Euh, Aujourd'hui, en fait, on s'est regroupé pour partager cette histoire et pour créer. Et euh, créer, pour nous, ça prend plein de formes. Ça rejoint beaucoup tout ce qui a été dit très bien euh, en un meilleur anglais que le mien. Euh, merci. Euh, nous, en fait, on, ce qu'on va partager ensemble aujourd'hui, c'est le patchwork des noms. Kessaring a fait partie, il a soutenu Act Up. Moi, j'ai été Act Up Lille. Euh, utiliser notre corps dans l'espace, dans la rue, dans les institutions, pour demander des droits. Mais quelque part, c'est ce qu'on va faire aujourd'hui ensemble. Parce qu'il y a encore des droits à réclamer, des besoins, de l'argent, mais aussi plein, plein de choses. Et puis, on a aussi besoin de se souvenir ensemble, parce que cette histoire, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui nous réunit. Faire des liens, c'est ce que permet l'art, c'est ce qu'on voit avec cette exposition qui est réunie des milliers et des milliers de personnes. On a passé la journée ici avec les militants d'ex de Sensoa, et vraiment c'était impressionnant, c'était plus de monde que dans une backroom à Paris un, un samedi soir, pour vous dire, il faisait très très chaud. Euh, pour vous dire aussi que toutes ces personnes, c'est vraiment des liens, c'est aussi des interactions, et nos histoires méritent d'être racontées. Celles que vous allez découvrir dans quelques instants ont été racontées sur des morceaux de tissu. Ils sont reliés, elles sont reliées, nos histoires, et on va les porter, on va les partager ensemble. Sur les murs de San Francisco, quand j'y suis allée pour fêter les 30 ans des sœurs de la perpétuelle indulgence, qui l'année dernière ont fêté leurs 40 ans, j'ai pu voir sur les murs écrire « Un peuple qui n'a pas de mémoire n'est pas un peuple rebelle ». Je nous souhaite d'être rebelles comme Kessarine, je nous souhaite d'être vivantes et vivants, 
et d'être rebelle à cette société hétéropatriarcale, capitaliste, qui en fait euh, ruine nos vies. Et on a mieux à faire que survivre, on a à vivre. C'est ce que m'a dit un livre vivant tout à l'heure à la bibliothèque euh, dex -Echo. Et pour moi, ça a été un message puissant. Donc je vous invite, même si je sais que vous avez à partir, et si vous partez, vous serez en pensée avec nous, donc tout va bien. Euh, faites pour être confortable, comme disent les Québécois. On va euh, monter ensemble ces quelques marches. On va aller vers notre histoire, on va l'écrire ensemble. Et puis je donnerai la parole à des activistes belges et français qui ont créé des patchworks des noms, qui nous viennent de San Francisco. On va voyager ensemble dans notre histoire, et on va continuer de la porter, on va en être fiers, et on va continuer de la créer. Donc, euh, allez, on monte tous ensemble, et ceux qui partent, on vous porte dans nos cœurs. Merci beaucoup, je pense qu'on peut applaudir les intervenants.